At this time, I will turn the opening of the meeting over to Councilman from District 1, Councilman Roberto Trevino. Sorry, I'm a lot shorter. That's okay. Just need to put on my glasses. So, uh, welcome everybody today. Uh, I'm your uh, councilman for District 1, Roberto Trevino. Uh, <clears throat> I would also like to thank uh, all the members that are here today uh, Councilman Saldana, uh, Ms. Nettie Hinton. This is uh, Maria Berrio Saba, uh, Ms. Christine Drennan, uh, Rod Radel, Richard Milk, and Jackie Gorman. I think we're missing Susan Shearer. Susan Shearer. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I um, want to start off by saying that uh, <clears throat> this is an important discussion to, to discuss the, the issues that impact central city neighborhoods. Uh, we're, we were charged uh, as a task force, to, task force to identify policies and programs that encourage investment in inner city neighborhoods but minimize or prevent displacement of people or adverse impacts related to history, culture, and quality of life of unique neighborhoods. Today the task force will present draft recommendations and listen to feedback from those in attendance. Task Force members will respond, respond to audience questions and comments about Task Force recommendations after the audience input session concludes. Uh, we've added an additional bilingual meeting, which is Wednesday, April 1st at South Sand High School. It will be at 6.30 p.m. We'll also provide written comments, questions via comment cards and online at sanantonio.gov forward slash planning until April 3rd. So that's available if you want to provide any written comments or questions. Input will be considered by task force before recommendations are finalized. <clears throat> not all issues can be addressed by this task force. This conversation does not end with the task force. The conversation will continue with the comprehensive planning process that's kicking off in April, the housing summit in May, and the permanent commission that the task force is recommending by uh, recommending be created. More on that later. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, I guess, begin the, the slideshow. We're gonna run through the slides briefly. Uh, I think everyone's had a chance to look at uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, the boards outside. So we'll, we'll go ahead and quickly run through these. I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly so that we can get straight to some of the discussion because I think that's probably most important. Um, some background, as you know, established uh, July 2014 by former Mayor Castro and now chaired by the Mayor uh, Ivy Taylor. Uh, it's comprised of community advocates, academics, nonprofit housing partners, developers, and elected officials. Uh, these are the names of some of the task force, or, or the task force members. Uh, again, the task force charge, as I read before, identify policies and programs that encourage investment in inner city neighborhoods but minimize or prevent displacement of people or adverse impacts related to history, culture, and quality of life of unique neighborhoods. The task force purpose is to review current policies, review best practices from other communities, identify short-term and long-term recommendations, seek community input, slash discuss scope of issue with community. Be inclusive of varying perspectives. So the discussion summary, uh, the task force discussed a range of topics on areas related to the task force charge, many of which warrant further discussion by, proposed, by the proposed commission. These topics are summarized below. And again, I think everybody had a chance to review the boards. Um, <clears throat> Some of our policy goals, to increase the number of mixed income neighborhoods throughout the city, to mitigate the human cost of re revitalization, including residential displacement, to identify reliable, dedicated funding sources to increase the availability of affordable and workforce housing, and to mitigate the cost of household displacement. 
we have some short-term recommendations uh, with a time frame of uh, about six months or less uh, to create a commission to track the implementation of task force recommendations to produce an annual report on neighborhood change. We also uh, looked at amending the zoning change notification process, designate the city housing counseling program and the fair housing council of great, greater San Antonio as primary resources for residents. Develop a relocation assistance policy, plan and host a housing summit. The long-term recommendations is to explore an inclusionary housing policy for city and Senate residential development. Pursue an affordable and workforce housing bond program in 2000, 2017. Develop a policy for creation and rehabilitation of alternative housing types. Explore the development of a community land trust or similar organization. Explore the creation of a neighborhood empowerment zone explore dedicated funding source for affordable housing. And what are the success measures? Um, the number of renter households displaced without adequate notification and compensation per year, uh, metropolitan area ranking in the Pew Research Center's residential income segregation index indicating a proportion of, uh, of residents living in mixed income neighborhoods, Percentage of occupied units with severe physical problems, HUD American Housing Survey. Percentage of hou households who pay 30% or more of gross income on housing, U.S. Census Bureau of American Community Survey, five-year estimate. Funds raised and leveraged by 2017 bonds for fulfilling the goals outlined in this document. And so here are some of the potential next steps. With that, I'd like to uh, reintroduce uh, Mimi to uh, begin the panel discussion. I'm gonna take this off because I'm so much shorter than he is. Um, I'll just be a talking head otherwise. Um, I wanted to let you know that um, all of the community members' comments are being compiled and they will be posted online after all the meetings are completed. Um, I'm speaking a bit slowly so the translator has an opportunity to translate. It, included in that compilation will be the, tonight's meeting comments and questions, as well as the comments and questions from the meeting that will be April 1st at South San. Prior to the inclusion of the comments from tonight's meeting, Community members' comments and questions are focusing on um, some very particular areas, and I wanted to let you know, um, most of you have attended the meetings, but to let you know what those are. Um, the need to prevent displacement is huge. Um, preservation, renovation, demolition, and relocation are huge topics of concern. The need for additional and you'll note that April 1st, there is the additional meeting on the south side um, in response to um, people's comments. The city should help residents and not developers is another huge area of focus. The need for affordable housing for seniors. The greater acknowledgement of the south side and the Mission Trail as the impetus for the discussion. Inequality and a living wage infrastructure needs, existing and suggested programs, so thank you for those suggestions for new programs to assist, translation, uh, the format of the meetings, and um, information being available online and the opportunity to comment online. Those are the main areas of focus for the previous two meetings, and I'm assuming that some of those will be from tonight and perhaps some new ones that will be added to the compilation. Just to let you know the public process, the public meeting at Tafoya had 133 attendees. At Ella Austin, there were 99 attendees for a total of 232 community members prior to tonight's meeting who have already engaged in the public process. And that doesn't include online comments. Those are people that were physically in attendance. Um, once again, there are ground rules for tonight's meeting. All questions and comments will be considered. 
We're going to ask that you focus on the topic, be clear and concise in making your comments, um, respect the audience members and the task members. Do not speak while others are speaking, and I ask this particularly this evening because the translator is sitting amongst us at the table, and any ambient sound coming from the audience will impact his ability to hear. Um, address questions and comments to the task force, and then respect the three-minute time limit uh, for questions and comments, and your three minutes, if the translation takes longer, don't worry, we will wait till the translation is finished before we'll take the next comment. Okay, let me get the sign-up sheet. Um, the, the microphone in the center of the room is, um, you can adjust it for your height. I'm very aware of height at this point. Um, Eligino Rodriguez, Eligino, Eugenio, I can't read. Rodriguez. I thought others would have signed up. Hello, my name is Eugenio Rodriguez. I spoke before, and sorry for going over the three minute limit, but it's that um, when elderly people lose their homes, they also lose their lives. It's called uh, they lose the will to live. And um, when I saw this at the other meeting, the governing, governing the G word gentrification, that concerned me. Uh, one of the things I would like to know or would hope that y'all could do if you have a chance, is look up uh, gentrification and the health effects of gentrification. The Center of Disease Controls does have information regarding that. It, um, the vulnerable populations have a shorter life expectancy, higher cancer rates, more birth defects, greater infant mortality, higher incidence of asthma, diabetes, and vascular disease. Now, that article can be taken both ways. The problem is that the people that you're trying to help are the people that you're getting rid of. So what good is it if you have bike lanes and all this kind of business is the people you were there to help in the first place aren't being helped in the first place. The other thing is the empowerment zones, please be very careful with those. We have what is called the West Side Development Corporation. Um, there were companies already approaching the, the group before it was even organized. Um, the place is on General McMullen and uh, Commerce. And what I realized is I went to a meeting and that, that group or that mall was asking for monies. And when they asked for the monies, it was interesting that they showed, oops, that they showed pictures of where the, the, the people said, oh, the place is blighted. Look, we don't have any businesses. Well, just by chance, what happened is they jacked up the rent. They bought the property, jacked up the rent, and then they show all these empty places, which is sickening because those places had been there for years and years and years. There's one that's leaving that really concerns me, and that was the Bank of America. A lot of the elderly use that bank. Now, I don't know if it's leaving on its own accord or if it's leaving because they too jacked up the rent. But they do get an incentive indirectly through the city because we have an SAPD office there. I don't think a place like that deserves any public monies after what they're doing. So there's no accountability. For that, uh, many years ago, in 2011, uh, there was a request from the Securities and Exchange Commission from, um, uh, no, Ms. Scully wrote to Ms. Elizabeth Murphy on February 11, 2011, concerning munis municipal advisors. If you look up that letter, you will see that it has a, a litany of, uh, of uh, corporations that have been formed by the city, different types. It's too long, uh, three minutes, I won't have time to tell you all this. But still, it has all these corporations, and what the Securities and Exchange Commission wanted was for there to be some type of accountability. Um, what Scully said was that those that are appointed to, uh, to commissions and boards not be considered municipal advisors, but be considered employees. The infrastructure, that's what we really need. Drainage, just go to McMillan West Commerce, and that whole area, we've been waiting for over 50 years for sidewalks close to a school, which is sickening. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Anyway, they just got to come up and move it to, to, to their level. Good evening. My name's Chuck Bain, and I'm not here representing anybody but myself. I've, I've been, uh, I do work on the west side. I'm a community organizer, work for Urban Connection, and I do uh, participate in the West End Hope and Action Organization as the treasurer. Um, and I've been observing the task force in process for quite a while. And it's been my distinct impression that the city staff but, and the staff and the elected officials both consider new business and economic increase as more important than the people who have long been taxpaying citizens. This particular process is going down the same careless trail traveled by our city in the past. That is, in the name of progress, our government will continually overlook the most vulnerable, poor, and elderly people of color. You know, the name of this task force is the Mayor's Task Force on Preserving Our Diverse and Dynamic Neighborhoods. I just don't see the effort going into the preservation of the neighborhoods as they exist now. There's always looking for how do we change the neighborhood. And I think that we, the task force needs to get back to how do we preserve the flavor of the na network or the neighborhoods that we've got? How do we preserve our single family neighbors? Thank you. Good evening, my name is Cynthia Spielman. I live in Beacon Hill, not far from here, actually walking distance. There's several things that concern me. Um, I think it's clear just by going to the meetings that people feel traumatized by their dealings with the city. I mean, I'm far from victimized, and I feel traumatized often by our dealings. Um, one of the, the things that I'd like to specifically address is the zoning process. Oops, that's okay, I'll just get it in a minute. Um, I know that that what you have um, on the board outside is amend the zoning change notification process, but in fact, there's a lot that's not being addressed here. I know as, as someone who's part of our board and we've worked with zoning and, and trying to work, you know, to keep developers from just taking over areas in our neighborhood, that often by the time it gets to us, it's a done deal. You know, we're working people and we're struggling to educate ourselves, to mobilize ourselves, to have discussion among ourselves, and it's a time-consuming process. And by the time we actually get to speak in front of boards, it's always, we always feel it's something of a done deal. And it's exhausting, and it's demoralizing, and it's frustrating. I, I wonder specifically about former Councilwoman Maria Berisabel's um, um, idea about establishing a, a mediation process, that when a developer comes into our neighborhoods, that we can form a mediation process with an unbiased third party, not the city, um, in order to try to work out um, what happens in our own communities. So I'm, I'm hoping maybe that can be addressed. Hi, good afternoon. I'm um, a resident of the East Side. I was um, born and raised in that community. I left to college to the University of Austin um, for school. Um, my aspirations are to be a, a public school teacher. And I'm still working toward that goal. But since I've returned to the East Side, I've seen so many changes, um, many of them positive, and many of them I have um, a, like a conflicting nature with because we talk about gentrification, but 
it's so visible on Cherry Street um, in the 78202 zip code. There are lofts coming up that start from $170,000 um, and up. And for working families, um, which is what the community is mostly made up of, that's just so um, hard to even think of. Um, with, with the income that you have, you're already limited to um, so many things. Um, sometimes it forces you to ask for um, public assistance monies um, just for food. Um, so, so the dream of maybe owning a home it seems so far away. So my question is, um, uh, how are we, or what is the city's plan of action regarding a lot of the families that are on public assistance or that um, maybe have um, Section 8 or are a part of the, the housing projects? Is there a plan of action to transition them into a home or is, or is the goal just to provide some sort of um, sub, like subsistence housing um, while they get on their feet? Like there's a plan of action for families and um, it would be great to know that there's a long-term housing plan for them um, and not just short-term rental um, living, um, which seems like is the only thing that's being invested in. Um, also, oh my gosh, there's so much. Um, I was reading your policy report and it said that one of the things that y'all wanna do is to mitigate the co human costs of displacement. And I just want y'all to keep in mind that there's some things that cannot be mitigated, for example, death. Um, I was, and I say this because a woman named Carol Thompson, which was a resident of Mission Trails, she was a homeowner of a mobile property, she recently passed away. And even though some monies had been given to her to relocate, the stress of, of um, finding a new community to live in and, and being familiar with um, the friends and, and um, the community that she had been used to, it just took a toll on her and she passed away. And, and I know that it's related. I just um, want us to consider that some things cannot be mitigated and it's best to preserve families, the, the social and um, fabric of the, fam uh, the communities that the families live in, in peace. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Carolyn Atkins. I share a great many of the concerns that have been raised already. Uh, about the dislocation and some of the lack of responsiveness for um, the, the residents of San Antonio. Seems like the developers and the growth is of greater interest. I've been a resident of San Antonio for 41 years. And for those 41 years, I have uh, been a renter the whole time and experienced some things that in talking with my city council person's office, I was informed about this meeting, otherwise I wouldn't have known about it. And so I go back to something that was raised at the very beginning, the need for more opportunities for input, ongoing input for this process. Um, what, there were two meetings, we added the one on South Sand, the bilingual one. There are countless rental properties, complexes on the north side as well. And that is not at all to diminish the needs on the south, west, and east sides. Okay. Um, today I was um, volunteering and assisting with an ESL class on the near west side, another volunteer from El Salvador who has a master's degree spoke to me of going to rent a simple apartment near the medical center and was told he would need to pay $1,000 in deposit there. 
Why? Because he was from another country. Okay? And why he raised? He said, because people from other countries just wouldn't take care of it as well. Okay? Blatantly something fair housing needs to deal with and so forth. Uh, I've had experience with fair housing. I'm glad it's there. Um, I'm, I found the limitations of that as well. When I contacted my council person's office and was informed of this meeting, um, I was told that the scope of the task force had been extended to include protection for renters, um, including such instances when repairs, necessary repairs or utilities are not provided and a way is found through the common, new, typical San Antonio Apartment Association lease to give notice that the renter is given notice and must vacate. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. And I would like to see that continued as part of the agenda. Thank you very much. Graciela Sanchez. I've been at uh, meetings such as this around Hemisphere, around Commerce Street, around transportation like VIA. I have never come to one of these meetings with three police there. I do not understand why we have these police. I'm sorry. They do not, police don't always make people feel safe. So uh, how many have we seen at the Hemisphere? Zero. At the Alamo? meetings, zero. This scares communities of color, especially working class and poor. That <laughs> Two, I want to know, did you task force members write this? Nettie, do you feel this is language that you wrote? No. Susan? Not entirely. Maria? Christine? Jackie. I think it's representative of the work that we did. Mr. Milk. I think it reflects our conversation. Rod. It reflects some of the conversation. Mr. Roberto. <laughs> okay. Just wanted people to know. Uh, Esperanza submitted about 14 questions. We haven't heard any of those answers. How will these questions that we proposed? or are concerned about being incorporated into the plan? My understanding that the questions you posed were part of the series of public input, and we know that we will have a meeting after the, the, these meetings to digest all of that. That's my understanding. Just because initially this was supposed to be a QA and, and we have not. Graciela, just for clarification, we're okay. going to take all the public input and then give the task force an opportunity to respond to that. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess what other people have said today how will diversifying neighborhoods not displace people? So far, you know, they're supposed to be diverse and dynamic, preserving diverse and dynamic neighborhoods. When I hear that you're going to diversify the neighborhoods, for me, that sounds like displacing neighborhoods. I also wanted to say that in reviewing uh, the board, building standards boards, um, we did some cracking of numbers, and you can see, I'll pass this around, District 2 has had over 250 calls or demolitions or, you know, compliance problems, where, and District 5, like 180 problems in the last two and a half years in District 1. So Districts 2, 5, and 1 are being targeted. That's all inner city. Who's, what, what policy is this, and how can we stop this from happening? I also know from reading the vacant building ordinance that part of the vacant building ordinance, which I believe none of you have read, talks about giving this land or these buildings to developers. 
There's also, sorry, just, have you all seen this creative class document from the Thank comprehensive you, plan? The creative class lives in the north northwest side. Thank you, Graciela. Wow, we would call them oppressor neighborhoods, we would call them, <laughs> but I want you all to see this because this is part of the plan, the comprehensive plan the city's positioning. And the other classes are, you, so, are service and workers. Gloria Suarez. It's okay there. I believe it's okay. Good evening. My name is Gloria Suarez. First of all, I want to thank each and every one of the city personnel that are here for, for being here for us. Uh, my topic mostly is because of the pedestrian. I, I am a member of the Five Points neighborhood. And, uh, my residence is on Warren Street. And uh, I'm interested in uh, in the Warren Street where it gets to uh, South Flores due to the fact that about five years ago the city was able to repay payment the the street itself and put uh, drainages, put uh, sidewalk, and all that. That was very nice. Certainly, we all from the, from the street thank each and every one of, of them. But uh, there's a drainage problem where uh, Warren Street and uh, South Flores meets. The, when it rains, it doesn't even have to rain too much. The, for the persons that have wheelchairs or the ones that uh, pedestrians, adults and children, they go through there to get to, to Austin uh, uh, School, Stephen F. Austin School, and they're not able to cross there. The water floods from all, all across Warren Street and part of the Flora Street. Even the bus stop is right there. When the bus stop, people cannot get on the bus due to the fact that the puddle is there and it goes up into part of the sidewalk. So that's one of the issues that I'd like to bring up. I don't know if it's something that you could work on there and see about that. And on, on uh, uh, the Mar Marshall Street, uh, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of um, of this, um, where the water gets stuck, uh, that there's holes in the ground. What, potholes? Yes, yes, uh huh. Potholes. Thank you. And and there there are numerous there, and of course the street in general needs to be paying repaying. Uh, the, the, the asphaltus, I guess it needs to be removed or something, but that street is in very bad condition. That's what the street worn, the street itself is good, but because of that, uh, coming back to Warren on, and Flores, because of that, sometimes the portal there, you cannot go through there even with a vehicle because sometimes it makes a, a puddle there. Thank you, Ms. Suarez. Selena Santibanez. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Selena Santibanez. I am a product of the East Side, born and raised 
I represent my niece, my nephew, my cousin, the next generation that lives in this city and that will grow up in our neighborhood, in our community. So the ones that we are trying to protect ultimately, correct? And so, um, as y'all all sit in front of us, you all work, you, you are here to protect those that do not have a voice. It is to give um, not only education, but information to those that do not have access, do not have the ability to be here today because they work, because they have children that they are unable to have daycare for. I want to just make a blanket statement. This whole gathering is very much reactive than versus proactive. You all are sitting here as if the, the fight has already been lost as gentrification is unedible un un what am I trying to say? Thank you. And that it's going to take place regardless. So this meeting is very much reactive to what's going to happen. What I want to know specifically is the majority of people who live in area codes such as 78202, 78208, they live under the poverty limits as of today and literally live paycheck to paycheck, where if they do not receive that next paycheck, they will be homeless. What is the city's plan of action and prepare? what are the, you all prepared to do to prevent that homelessness? Not only for the burden of the organizations that already serve this city as finely as they do. I am a past social manager, social worker for the Salvation Army. I did help Katrina aid today. I also lived in other cities that model. I'm also interested in looking at those model cities that we are, it, are we looking at model cities that have such as Salt Lake City that has eliminated eliminated homelessness, uh, the gentrification that is about to take place, like I said, very reactive versus proactive is what, what are we going to do with those families? I, am, I was homeless as a child. I did live in the streets. I know what Sam and Saha and everybody else can do, but if we don't actually work to prevent this, then that burden is not only going to fall on the organizations, the city taxpayers, but also you all as, as the persons to hold the voice for the community. So I am very, very frustrated to see that my city is evolving in a way that is not to, to the cater of the city or to the best interest of our next generation. Rather, it is to that who can, who can pay the most taxes or those who can invest the most money. And it is certainly not the people that live and are from here that are investing those dollars. And so if we're bringing in new companies, new organizations to find themselves in these areas so that we can have a dynamic revitalization of the downtown, then why don't we, why don't we allow people who are local residents to work the those jobs? Why aren't we allowing people to have who have invested their communities and generations to make sure that they are prevented from being homeless? Because at the end of the day, that's what should really matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Carol Wood. Um, we need, uh, I'm here to say that we need uh, rent control or rent stabilization ordinances in the city for tenants. This, this is done in all kinds of cities and in places that I've lived previously, including New York City. Um, I'm glad that downtown is revitalizing. I'm glad of uh, SA 2020 and all the development that's happening. But I live two blocks from here, and the landlord six months ago started raising the rent 25%. This has impacted seniors that have lived there, some of them 10 years, 15 years since the place opened. It, uh, a, a guy that was legally blind, um, disabled, two months ago he got a notice he had to move out with, um, and move in with relatives. This week, an 87-year-old woman received the same notice. Everyone's getting it. Um, it, it there is no protection. A 25% increase is massive. It's not even done over uh, three years. And um, it's, uh, so that's what I think needs to be done to protect seniors, disabled, and just tenants that have lived here uh, because the people that have lived here 10, 8, 15 years are the ones that are giving the stability and the base to the downtown and uh, know it and create the neighborhood. So it, it is uh, shredding something that's been worked on to be built up. Thank you, Ms. Wood. Brian Gordon. Uh, 
Uh, I'm a resident of the east side and I work on the east side, uh, but I grew up on the northwest side. I grew up um, in a neighborhood where uh, neighbors were in contact with phone call sheets, things like that, you know, so um, I want to make sure that whenever we improve the quality of life of the areas that uh, you guys are focusing on, that it's not a lifestyle that is unaffordable. Uh, it needs to be a lifestyle that uh, is obtainable to the people that still live there. Um, you know, if you try to increase things and try to beautify the area, um, just like uh, she was saying before, uh, renters will jump on that and raise the rent, and that's what implements these things. So we need to make sure that as uh, these improvements do happen, that there's also things in set that make sure that uh, other people don't get displaced out of these communities that have built these relationships with their neighbors. Um, they know best what's going on in the communities. Um, and they can't always be out here to have these kind of discussions. Um, so I, I, I definitely think that there needs to be a little bit more of this in the, involved in the neighborhood associations too. Jesus Vidales. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm native born in San Antonio, Texas. The most wonderful, beautiful city in the country. I was born on the deep west side 93 years ago. And to this day, I have not seen nothing that has ever been tried to do for the beautification of my city. Back in the days when I was a child, we did not have no city council people at all, only commissioners and the mayor. But nobody cared about the whole city in San Antonio, to say the truth. Probably nobody knew the recognition of my city, and San Antonio is the only city in the entire United States that has more historical recognition than any other city in the country. And back in the days when I was a child, we had too much poverty, too much neglect, too much discrimination, and nobody cared about humanity. I knew what it was to be hungry and not have nothing to eat, but not because my daddy and I want to work. There were no jobs to be had. He was an architect, was always discriminated because he was a Mexicano. And to this day, I have not seen nothing that whoever tried to revamp the side of my city. I was born right in the heart of the west side. Ever since then, we had to walk over muddy streets, holes, no sidewalks, no pavement, anything at all. And I cannot swallow to this day that nobody seems to care about the recognition of the west side and also for San Antonio. We need a lot of revamping to be done in, in my side of the city. But it seems to me that the city council that we have had, either they don't recognize my city at all, or they have not had the power of ability to speak out to try to see what they can do for the side of my city. Now, back in the 30s, in the 40s and in the 20s. We didn't have no, represent no representation either. When President Franklin E. Roosevelt came into office, he was the one that changed the livelihood for the entire country. We had a lot of people that had no homes. The homes that they had were dilapidated. Nobody had enough money to revamp them and keep them in good shape. And to this day, I still see a lot of homeless people, a lot of poverty, a lot of people on my wayside that need their homes to be repaired 
and care for, to help them. They don't have the economic means to try to do the repair themselves, and it is horrible. Now that we have city council people, I'm hoping and praying that they can open their eyes and the ability to see what we need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vidalis. Karim Torres, Jr. My name is Karim Torres. I filled out a sheet of paper the other day. And uh, I didn't know this, but currently I'm considered homeless for the city of San Antonio. I'm a single father. And I went from house to house in the past two years. I'm studying social work and have a few questions and comments. What are, the future what are the future specific policy goals in which you plan to create specifically for any future developing that creates gentrification which creates more poverty? And apparently death, which is what I didn't know until today. I'm sorry for those that died, rest in peace. In what ways will we see that happen? meaning availability to the public. There are adult education centers that are being closed down when developing happens that strip us of our development. To start a new businesses, we need to educate ourselves as you do. We need to learn new technologies as you do. I believe that it is important to develop a city from the inside out. In practicality, a gentleman can create a business for himself and his family when there is support from the city to do so. This creates a developing economy inside out. This creates common unity within our marginalized communities. Specifically, what other types of support will be provided for those affected? Ideas like the stability of rent, which is what I just heard, and the production of education centers. For example, IT education centers. Things that the youth have availability to to educate themselves and then create more businesses from there. Thank you. Thank you. Jesse Lara. Mr. Lara. Thank you. I have three issues. The first one is I agree with Graciela Sanchez that the police officers are not needed here this evening. I don't know which one of you made the decision to hire them, but I think that they should not be paid for being here. There's no need for them to be here. This is a community meeting. This is not a uh, war zone. It's not a terrorist meeting. This is a community meeting. And I recommend that whoever hired them, please see to it that they do not get paid for being here. Also, I have a issue with your policy goals. Your first statement is very discriminatory, and I would ask that you change that. To increase the number of mixed income neighborhoods throughout the city, are you telling me that uh, the Spurs who live at the Dominion are going to move to the west side or the east side or on the south side? Is that what you're saying here? Are you telling me that uh, minimum wage worker working at McDonald's is going to move to the Dominion? This statement is very discriminatory and I would ask that it be changed, the language. And then um, I would like to know or to ask you to keep in mind that you cannot just consider permanent housing as the main focus of all your work. Apartment dwellers 
are in much need of affordable rents. Right now there is a, I live downtown, I live in the downtown area at the Opie Schnabel Apartments, which is part of the San Antonio Housing Authority. And um, the downtown market is horrendously high. There is a uh, par apartment complex going up at St. Mary's and Cesar Chavez. I want to know who the target market population for those apartments is going to be because those rents are going to be absolutely unaffordable. And I want to know why or who the developer is that's doing that and who the population is going to be. If I could move over there, I would, but I'm sure that I can't afford it. And then the last thing that I want to um, mention is disaster accommodations. There was a horrible tornado in Oklahoma, as everybody is aware of by now, I hope. And let's say that here in San Antonio one day we have a tornado or even an earthquake because we do live in an earthquake uh, sensitive area, especially with all the fracking that's going on. And so I'm wondering just what is your housing policy going to do to help residents or anybody who should be affected by a disaster such as that. Please keep that in mind as you go along doing your work, and please change this first statement of your policy goals because that's very discriminatory. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lara. Um, at this time, that was the last speaker that we had signed up for this evening. Um, I would like to turn it over to the task force members to respond to any of the comments or the questions that have been brought up by the speakers this evening. I want to respond to uh, Ms. Graciela Sanchez's question about the report and if it is the work of the task force. And as you saw, uh, there are um, eight, nine people here, and we all had a mix of, of uh, answers. Some said a bit, some said no, some said yes. Uh, and, and I just want to clarify something. Uh, this report, was given to the task force, it was prepared by staff. It includes discussions, uh, recommendations uh, from the point of view of the staff. There's some here that weren't discussed. And for myself, uh, I prepared um, some recommendations. Uh, for example, the one that Cynthia Spielman um, spoke of uh, on a mediation process, it's there. I have issues of demolition and looking at the whole demolition process, uh, issues of uh, making sure that when there are homes available for, for sale at the courthouse, that the process be transparent and accessible, because I know people who have tried to buy those houses and the deal is cut before they ever get there. So anyway, so I prepared all these um, recommendations. They are not, we, we never discussed them. They are not part of this report. Uh, so, uh, when my recommendations haven't even been discussed, this is not my report, okay? Uh, and I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, what I have asked is that there be appropriate time for the task force to discuss not only my recommendations, but others that some task force members made and are not there yet. So I would like to call it a work in progress, uh, that uh, we need to go back and include what has been recommended we need to include the comments, uh, all your comments, and I thank you for coming, I thank you for your comments, um, and uh, that we need to discuss the comments of three meetings that have been held, another meeting that's gonna be held, we need to discuss the report to make sure that we all at least discuss them, and then develop a process where if some of us don't get everything we want, that's fine, but at least we discussed it. But what I ask you who are here uh, is that you hold us accountable. Nothing, uh, even when I was an elected official, I would tell people nothing is gonna happen if the public doesn't hold us accountable and you have a right to do it. And if you don't like something, you tell us. And, and I make myself available 
uh, whatever you need to tell me, uh, please do it, and I'll, I'll do my best. So it's a work in progress. We have a lot of work to do, and we need to have at least a couple of meetings to discuss everything that has to be discussed. Up to this point, we just have one scheduled because there's no way that we can discuss all this in an hour and a half. I must tell you, I am embarrassed to be a part of this, whatever we want to call it. I, I, I would like to think that if Julian Castro had remained as our mayor when he initiated this task force at the urging of Diego Bernal, because of the, the, the terrible situation that developed along Mission Trail and the people who were were residents of, of that area for so many years, were displaced because uh, the owner decided to sell the property to a developer, probably because of the UNESCO vote that will be held very soon that will make that area an international historical site. And the, the greed factor kicked in, and people decided that they were going to make money off of this area that had been neglected for many, many, many years, but would, would displace the people who had that as a community for many, many years in, in order to, to take advantage of the UNESCO siding. I would like to believe that if Julian and Diego had been here, it would have remained focused on the displacement of citizens of San Antonio uh, and not on economic development and the development of mixed-use communities. I also am unhappy about the fact that although the federal government uses the term affordable housing in many of the documents and the conversations that it has about housing, that it really is not a term that responds to what we have here in San Antonio, and that is a need for workforce housing. When we look at what it is that fuels the economy of San Antonio, yes, we have for many years had the military as one of the, the, the chief components of our economic development. And in later years, we have had the medical industry being a chief developer of economic development. But San Antonio has, since the days of cattle being moved from one place to the other along the various trails, been a place where people were moving in and through this city and were accommodated by many, many, many kinds of people. And we remain an economy that has the service industry as, as really the impetus for what it is that employs many, many of the people that are here in San Antonio in just about all of our districts. Perhaps not in uh, 9 and 10, but I live in District 2. I know it's true of District 1 and 4 and 5. But it is this workforce housing that we need, and it is the protection of people who are in the service industry and lower income jobs that we need to make certain that they have a, a robust and viable community that they can call their own. And I feel that with Julian Castro and Diego Bernal not leading the charge that they had initiated, that we have lost focus. And things have been, some people on the committee, but also in the direction that has come from city staff to look at trying to get all of our neighborhoods that may be seen as disadvantaged now as mixed communities. So we have people of varying um, wage levels there so that the communities can be developed because they believe there are people there who want to buy Starbucks coffee or something of that nature. Um, we are a community that in the earliest days went to ice houses. And we still do in many of our viable, dynamic communities in San Antonio. Uh, I, I feel the sting of uh, gentrification where I live in, in Dignity Hill. I find people in my front yard, and I happen to live in a house that's on the, the National Historic Register of Homes. 
Um, so it's a nice looking limestone house and need a bunch of stuff, but um, it's, it's, you know, it, it, it looks like a great place for somebody who's up and coming um, to, to, to want to live in. And I find them in my, my front yard and, and I ask them, may I help you? And they say, oh, we're thinking about buying this property. And I say, do you see a for rent sign or for sale sign? And they say, oh, it's listed on the internet. That is how people who are flipping houses in the neighborhoods that are near the downtown, the near downtown neighborhoods, that's how they're operating. And I, I believed when Mayor Castro uh, asked me to be a part of this committee that he understood that I understood where the dangers were and, and that I would be one of those voices to try to help preserve the neighborhoods and not get people displaced and changed because you have people coming in from the suburbs, the empty nesters, or you have millennials who are moving to San Antonio and they're not interested in having a bunch of babies, but they do want to live in an apartment that's relatively close to downtown so they can be a part of the action, uh, whether it's near the Pearl or, or whatever it is that you think is the, is the, is the neat place to be these days. I, I want to make certain that my neighborhood the east side of San Antonio remains this place of historical significance that is inviting to people who want it to be a community that they live and raise their children and send their children to the public schools and, and be contributing citizens to society. And you don't have to be wealthy or affluent people to be able to be a good citizen in San Antonio. On? Yes. Thank you. Um, I was the one that said a bit because there are, there are things in this report that we discussed. Um, personally, what I feel, and I think I speak for some of us, is that it, it, does, it does lack an overarching kind of story on neighborhood change. And, that, and, and the fact that, that neighborhoods are not just real estate, neighborhoods are communities. Um, and for a lot of us, that's where the, so that's where our, that's where, where the, the safety net is. We can't we don't buy it, you know, we have each other. Um, and, and so uh, hopefully that, can, that, that part of the conversation will continue. But the one thing that I do hope that people will keep on their radar is one of the ideas that has come out is this bond and the use of bond money to, personally, I'm hoping that we can get this conversation in the direction that, the, 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 that there might be some public or bond money available for rehab. Because we inherit hundreds, if not thousands, of neighborhoods that are in need of, re of rehab money. And, and a lot of us don't, you know, don't have that or are, are, like myself, very financially conservative. It's like, I'm not going to take out a loan. And so I try to save and save and save to, put, to, to keep that house together. But this is one place that we as the public, and especially those who of us who are really concerned about our existing neighborhoods and preserving them, that yes, they're, no, they're not mixed income neighborhoods. They were not built mixed income. But there's no reason that we can't have a working class stable neighborhood. Or, uh, you know, in, in, you know um, workforce housing, as, as Nettie preferred the term, affordable housing, whichever. You know, that, that, that work, that, that those neighborhoods that we inherit, that, you know, are eighty ninety thousand dollars $90,000 houses. Um, they're not new houses, and they're homogeneous. There's no reason that those neighborhoods can't be stabilized. They don't have to be high crime. They don't have to be deteriorating. So one of the things that does come out of this task force, fingers crossed, is this idea for a bond. And there's, and there's going to be probably a lot of resistance to that. You know, the, and the philosophical argument that do we use public money to invest or to rehab private housing? Some of us feel that we do because our housing is, a, is actually both a private good and a public good. We all benefit if our housing is in good shape. Because, you know, for, because taxes and all of that, all of that kind of stuff. But we all benefit. So I think that we as a community really care deeply about trying to, the preservation part of this, 
really need to, 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 to think about this, the bond possibility, to watch it as it evolves and to get involved in it, because I do think there could be a lot of, uh, probably a lot of resistance to it. Um, and so if, you know, if that's one of your issues, please join us. And we can figure out together how to push that one through. Because the bond, that, that process is, is going to start within the next couple of months. I just wanted to uh, thank you for spending your evening here. And for many of you in the audience, I've seen you at all three of our sessions so far. I really believe that it's the community who can make it, um, ha who has a strong voice with your compelling statements and what you said will now be entered into the record. If I look back on all the meetings of the task force, um, what, in hindsight, we should have provided for input at every single meeting. It's easy to say that now, but um, it, looking forward, maybe that'll happen. And clearly, from the first meeting on the west side, it was an enormous message to uh, city staff who prepared the meeting that they need to take in consideration the people who are at the meeting. So I applaud your efforts. Y you speak with a unified voice, and you'll make the report stronger. And I just want to thank you. Was, was somebody else going to say something? Because I have a question that I'd like to ask of someone from staff who's here. I'm one of these people who's a news junkie. And I read the Express News religiously. I also re read the, the newspapers that circulate uh, on the east side, Snap, Observer, Register, La Prensa. Uh, and I listen to National Public Radio. And I listen to KTSA. It gets my panties in a bunch. <laughs> Because I'm a red dog Democrat, and I mean a yellow dog Democrat, and they're red cat something elsers. But in the Express News the other day, there in the legal and public notices was something that I thought very interesting. It's from the City of San Antonio Department of Planning and Community Development, a revised public notice. A public hearing, originally scheduled to take place on April 9th, 2015, will now take place beginning at 9 a.m. on Thursday, April 16th in the City Council Chambers at Municipal Plaza. And this, this will be a U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development required citywide public hearing for a substantial amendment to the city's FY 2015 Consolidated Annual Action Plan budget to authorize a reprogramming action in an amount not to exceed $1,500,000 in community development block grant funds for housing and community development related activities and to establish a revolving fund with neighborhood stabilization program NSP revenues generated from the sale of property of the land bank activities to support redevelopment efforts in targeted areas. Uh, picking up La Prensa just yesterday, I noticed that there was a very large uh, reprinting of this in La Prensa in both English and Spanish. But what I saw first was this teeny weeny legal notice in the Express News. And it was the first that I knew that the city was even searching for monies that had to do with housing and community development and neighborhood stabilization. And my question to somebody here in staff who's been working with us all this time, why did that never come to our attention? Why did I have to find this out by reading the Express News in the classified, in the legal area? Seems like it would have been number one on the table for us to be at least aware of because we've been talking about funds and housing and land banks for community development and neighborhood stabilization.
Thank you. Is that on? Thank you, Ms. Hinton. Uh, it's a reprogramming action for federal grant funds. Um, it's uh, something that, that occurs often as, as needs change, we adjust um, how the funds are allocated. It's something that goes through the council, city council committees and then the final action is approved by city council. Um, that's, that's the typical process that it goes through before any changes are made. The question I'm asking you is since it seems to deal with the question we've been dealing with, why is it that it was not brought to the table? Aren't y'all the people putting this on? Aren't you all responsible for what we're doing up here? Aren't y'all honchoing this dynamic neighborhood gentrification program for the city since Julian and Diego Brunel are not here? Isn't this your baby? So again, for the reprogramming action, um, we are taking it through the typical process. But which what does it consist of, and why are we not even familiar with the bare details of it, since it seems to be dealing with what we have been struggling with for these weeks, and for which you, are, you hope to go to City Council on April 9th, the date that you're reprogramming this public hearing from April 9th to April 16th. And remember, we've been asking for this task force to be able to extend its time to continue to discuss and come up with some things. And you all have said no, that there is a timetable that we must continue to follow. And you haven't been interested in extending our time. So Ms. Hinton, I, I unfortunately do not know the specifics of that reprogramming action, and I don't want to speak to it because it is very, very detailed. But we can certainly get that information to the task force. Um, that's something we can do tomorrow. I think she's really asking why isn't that information being shared? It, it's such a small piece, and y'all are investing so much of your time and your dollars. Why are we informing and educating and just giving as much information to the public? I, I mean, get me wrong, but it's all about awareness. And if it's a small, if the city costs $25 to take off out of a small ad, the money that the city's investing in this program, why is it to actually where everybody in the city pick up the newspaper and see exactly what's going on in the city. So I'd, I'd like to um, just say a few things. Um, so I'm, I'm the councilman that replaced uh, or was appointed for Diego Bernal's spot. Um, and you know, I just want to address a couple of things. Number one, you, we, we are talking about, uh, and, I, and I do agree that this is, this is part of a, of a continuing process. I think it's important to understand that uh, what we're really talking about here is how do we continue this conversation. I, I certainly appreciate what you're saying. Uh, I appreciate the questions. Um, in the end, you know what 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 I've learned um, sitting on council is that a lot of the big questions come from what are the what's what seems to be the process that something goes from A to B. Uh, early on, we had a case uh, that, that uh, I had to address uh, of a gentleman whose, whose home was about to be demolished um, and how it got to that point in, in his story. And I, I felt the frustration then. I feel it now. It's, this is not an easy task. Uh, I think what we're really looking at here is ultimately we've got to kind of, in a way, work backwards. It's about dignity and make sure that we're always thinking about that, people's dignity, to keep it in place. Um, but these, these tasks are very complex, they're very nuanced. Um, every time we run into an issue at, uh, in my office, we're, we're sort of working backwards with the process. There's so many different departments. Uh, earlier we were talking about BSB, for example. And I know there was a case recently where it seemed that uh, a department like BSB and another uh, department like Office of Historic Preservation were at odds um, over the demolition of a, a particular home, set of homes. And, um, and so the, you know, the question that I asked was, what, what, what was the process of that? What, why can't these two different departments talk or work together? Um, 
I think the issues that we have are, are incredibly complex, especially in District 1. District 1 being the oldest district, obviously it's going to have the oldest infrastructure. Uh, now, by the way, as an architect, I also recognize that there's, there's, there's a difference between some of our structures that are, that are built robustly and some that are what I would call disposable housing because they're, they're not going to last. Um, there's, there's, there's a way to build things well and there's a, a way to build things for a temporary use. So we've got to be careful with that too. Um, <clears throat> I think what's, what, what I'm hoping we can establish is uh, a process where we're continually improving and involving the community, and I think that's certainly key. And I'm encouraged by seeing uh, uh, people out here and have taken notes about some of, the, some of the, the issues and some of the feelings that people have. I think it's important for me as a council member to, to try to learn as much as we can our staff is, is learning uh, about the different processes and how we can connect our different departments to better serve our community. Uh, there's, the, the, the real issue here is, is to create a, a real culture of collaboration, to truly uh, work together to try to figure this out. I, I think there's a feeling that, like we just heard, that why aren't we getting a piece of information? Why, why is it given to us in pieces or late or not at all? Uh, I think it's important that we uh, establish a better process. And I, transparency is key, of course. I think uh, you know everybody up here on this panel is, is working very hard to sort of try to figure that out. Uh, again, my hope is that uh, everybody feel and, and understand uh, that this is part of that process. This is a, the, the draft copy. Uh, uh, the hope is that we have a, a, a continual improvement of this particular process. Uh, I, think, I think certainly I, I support the idea of, of, of more meetings, of, of continued conversations, uh, more involvement from our community. Uh, I mean, earlier I mentioned the BSB board. You know, this, is, this is a community that, that should be asking to, to, to be appointed to certain commissions that, that actually uh, make a difference, that actually impact its community. And that's it's very important to get involved, uh, to be a part of things in their community so that, so that their voice is heard. Uh, but know that uh, certainly uh, you know, there, there is uh, a commitment to continue this process, from, uh, at least uh, for, from this board. So I uh, certainly appreciate the, the conversation today. You know, at at all of these meetings, at the three meetings that we've gone to, I've been really impressed by the passion at which people approach the mic to talk about the things that interest them. Some of them I can really wrap my mind around and, and say, okay, we can make that work. Um, others of them, I really am having a hard time wrapping my mind around. And I've stopped a couple of people and asked them if they could help me out. We have. And we didn't hear it tonight, but at the other two meetings, we heard it quite a few times that people said that no one should ever be displaced from their home. Um, and my question is, when you are talking about renters, how do you accomplish that without taking away the property rights of the person who owns the property? If anybody can show me how we can do that, or even show me how it's being done in other places, or because I don't think we have to invent things here. Sometimes we can take what somebody else is doing and make it work in our community, but I just haven't seen that any place. So, um, you know, if you want to talk to me after, you know, after the thing, or send me an email, I would love to know how you how we accomplish that and still maintain the rights of those people who own that property. Because we've looked at a lot of things, and, and one of the things that we talked about, and, and that was very frustrating to me, is that Texas is a property rights state. And there are some things that we think would be quick fixes to some of the issues that we've brought up that we are just legislatively prohibited from doing. Um, and so that doesn't mean we give up, that just means we can't do it today. 
You know, we have to have a plan to go try to get that changed. So it doesn't matter if it's not something that can happen today. I'd just like to know how we do it, and then maybe we come up with a plan of how to get there. But I just don't know it yet. Mr. Radel? Just, just a few comments. Um, one, as has been said multiple times already, this is a draft report on some of the items that have been discussed by this group. There's been no vote taken on anything. And as the councilman's pointed out, we need to hash through not just this report, but the feedback that has come in from the community that the majority, I, I think everyone on this uh, task force has been looking for to get the feedback from the community. So again, we appreciate that very much. But just two ancillary comments, which is probably known to everyone in this room, if you think back to uh, pre-K for SA, that would not have passed unless there was a concerted effort from the leader of this community, the mayor at that time, in working with a broad spectrum of individuals across the city to get it passed to help our kids. The same is true with the bond that Christine was speaking of earlier. Unless we have a concerted effort over a period of the next two, possibly four, depends on when this bond can come forward, it will not pass. We have to be involved. That also means we have to vote. We have to vote for officials that will go ahead, and I'm not making any endorsements here. We have to vote for officials that will speak up and say, we need to have substantial resources committed to addressing rental and owner-occupied units. If we don't do that, it will never happen. So that's where the real work is gonna take place. It's gonna take place in our neighborhoods, and we have to work forward uh, to get that done in, in a concerted fashion. So I'd encourage you to keep talking, don't give up, keep giving us feedback, but also keep working in the communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, when we started this process, uh, or partway through it, uh, at any rate, uh, Mayor Taylor asked us to uh, be sure and include um, ample opportunity for public comment, and I understand why. Uh, and I want to thank you again from, uh, for being here, for spending time, for sharing your thoughts. It's not easy to be on the other side of the mic, and I appreciate your articulating that. You've raised a number of questions, a number of thoughts, that some uh, have come up in our conversations, and some are new, and uh, we will take these ideas back and, and discuss them, and I just want to reflect back to some of the ones that stood out to me. You talked about goals and being clear about what our policy goals uh, are and should be. And I think that's important. And, the, the, and you brought up a number of related issues around goals that had to do with health, that had to do with focusing on vulnerable populations defined in a number of different ways. I think that's important. Um, you talked about process. You talked about transparency. You talked about uh, making sure that uh, and here I'm paraphrasing, that we all are equally comfortable with the processes that, uh, that are occurring around us in a number of different ways in our neighborhoods. And I think that's important for us to wrestle with. How do we, how do we think about r real estate? How do we think about property? How do we think about renting and the processes and access to, to zoning, to, to uh, changing these things and making sure that we all have uh, equitable access to that? You talked about um, preservation, both of the physical fabric of our neighborhoods and of the social fabric, and preserving those social ties. Um, on the physical side, um, you talked not just about housing, and not just about apartments, but also about infrastructure. You mentioned streets, you mentioned drainage, you mentioned kind of that network of sort of invisible work that ties us all together, whether we realize it or not. 
And uh, there's a deep history of that in, in all our neighborhoods. So, um, thank you. I think that's, it's uh, very important uh, for us to take that back and to keep working with it. And as I think we've all said, we'll continue this process. Again, I just want to thank everybody for coming out today. I um, want to make a, again, a couple of reminders, a reminder about additional opportunity, opportunities to provide uh, input. Additional bilingual meeting will be held uh, Wednesday, April 1st, South Sand High School at 6.30 p.m. Uh, you can provide written comments, questions via comment cards and online at sanantonio.gov forward slash Plan, uh, planning until April 3rd. Uh, input from the four meetings, written comment cards, and online comments will be considered by the task force before recommendations are finalized. Uh, and I use that word finalized loosely, guys. Uh, you know, we've been talking about uh, you know the, how frustrating this 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 can be for most, and we, we do welcome a, as much input as possible. Please take advantage of of these opportunities you have to to uh, uh, provide any comments, uh, whether through the comment cards or online. Um, the uh, final task force recommendations will be available to the public for review and will be presented to City Council on April 29th during a B session. The conversation will continue with a comprehensive planning process that's kicking off in April. The Housing Summit in May and the Permanent Commission that the task force is recommending be created, so please stay involved. Uh, again, really need, need the community to stay involved, know that your, your voice is being heard. Uh, again, I want to thank my panelists uh, for, for being here today. Uh, really appreciate everybody for coming out and sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, and back to Mimi. Thank you. You're not going to let his voice be heard? I, I want to reiterate what um, Councilman Trevino said and also to make sure that everyone makes note that April 1st is a on a Thursday, and instead of at 6 o'clock, the meeting will begin at 6.30 at South Sand, so it's a little bit different. It starts at 6.30. Um, this will be the final public meeting before the task for force takes all of the comments um, and all of the questions into consideration for community, of all the community input for their discussion. So we're going to put all of that together in provide it to them from all four of the meetings, the two that have already happened, tonight's meeting, and the meeting on the 1st of April. So they will be considering all of those things together, and all the public input will be available to them. Um, I wanna thank you all again for coming out this evening. The task force members were available for, um, for you to have a conversation with before they leave, and thank you very much.